Hey legends and welcome back to the channel where we care about every 10th. Playing through the recent AMS2 update with the Sigma P1 and the Kale Army Grand Prix circuit made me realize that we were given a great opportunity for a case in point scenario. As I had never before raced either the car or the track, and the car just happened to come with a less than ideal default setup, it created a great opportunity to showcase the importance of car setups in racing. What we're going to do today is show you two laps done back to back, both being my very first attempt at setting lap times on the global leaderboard in time trial mode. The first lap is done with the default setup, whereas the second lap is done with a tweaked setup. We're going to talk through the differences in both car handling and ultimate performance, then we're briefly going to break down what I did to the car and why. This will not be an in-depth car setup tutorial, but a brief overview to help you understand why we make certain changes and how you can hopefully incorporate those into your own process when tweaking default setups to make cars which you previously thought undrivable a little bit more friendly. While these laps are far from perfect due to various factors, the key thing is that they're consistent between one another because they're done back to back by the same person in the same state of play. The main difference is the setup. Before we get to the laps, make sure to smash subscribe in order to stay up to date with future sim racing news, reviews and guides. With enough interest, we may work on developing a video or series specifically on car setup. Alright, so kicking off my first ever lap on time trial mode with the Sigma P1 at the Kale Army Grand Prix circuit. I literally just loaded this up with the default setup and just went straight after it. The idea was to just do an off the cuff run after, you know, about an hour or two of trying to learn the track and seeing where we end up. So braking just before the 100 meter board, I turn in. Having a lot of brake balance issues, but the first thing I noticed there was a little bit of a uh, tendency to understeer off power. Otherwise the car's absorbing the bumps quite well. Had to turn in a little bit more than was desired there. Didn't use as much runoff as I needed to. Again, having a lot of trouble uh, getting the confidence to really push with this car. As forgiving as the setup is, you can tell it's soft, it's absorbing all the bumps. The car's just kind of traveling along. It, it lacks directness. It lacks purpose. Feels a little more road car-ish than you would want on a GP circuit. Handles the curb really well on the inside. Uh, the ride height is quite generous. Just can go fairly flat here. Braking hard at the 100 meter board and turning back in. Not afraid of grabbing the curb on the inside because the car again is very forgiving to that sort of thing. It's grabbing the undulations on the track really well as you can see. So far so good as far as uh, an opening lap goes. Now I normally get a lot of understeer here, let's see. Okay, not too bad, I over slowed in order to make that work. But it seemed to work out well enough. Bit of a pivot in and then back on the power as early as possible. And now I tend to get understeer here too, so let's see how this goes. Yep, just shot out wide. Not for want of trying, mind you, scrub the tires all the way through. And across the line for a very mediocre 145 flat. Now, let's see how we do with the tweaked setup. Alright, so we're coming up to the start line with the tweaked setup lap, which happened almost immediately after the one that you just saw. Pay special attention to the way that the car handles, the, the differences in input. Coming into the first corner, brake point was pretty much the same. Car turns in way more, you can see there's a correction midway. Car's instantly way more purposeful, bites into the corners. Brake and early turning, you can, you can see that it's just rotating with way less steering angle. Which can be a good or a bad thing depending on how ready you are to catch the slide. Coming in here, car just bites in again. Doesn't matter what speed you're going at, the car just bites in more. Same brake points for the most part. Oh, yep. Mid corner corrections are pretty much the name of the game with this setup. As you can tell, the car is a lot more nervous with this setup. You can tell I have to be a lot more careful when the car's weight shifts, when it lightens, when it gets to the crest of a hill. Again, maintaining all the same brake points, overshooting that a little bit. 
but cutting back down to make up for it. Car feels a lot flatter, it feels a lot more direct in the hands, it feels a lot more like a thoroughbred race car. And similar brake point coming in again. Again, taking it fairly easy over there, but the line feels a bit cleaner. And pivoting in, avoiding the curbs on the inside as much as possible, and the final corner. Okay, we've avoided some of that understeer that we had. There is a nasty bump there, but uh, it's not as bad as it was the last time. And across the line for a whole two seconds quicker than the default setup. Mind you, these two runs happened back to back. There was no great time. There was no great span of learning or developing new techniques. It is literally the same car, two different adjustments back to back. So let's delve into what we did in the setup, why the car behaved that way on the second lap and why we got the extra two seconds shaved off our lap time. All right, so here we are looking at the setup page for the Sigma P1. Here's how the car loads up. Now, contrary to popular wisdom, we're not actually gonna change anything on the main quick setup page. It's not strictly necessary to balance out the main issues with this car. Instead, we're going to go to advanced setup. And now, the first thing we're going to do is go to the tires, brake, and chassis adjustment. And the first thing we're going to do is adjust the rear tire pressure 0.02 bar down. The reason for that is that will tend to deflate the rear tires, obviously, and give you a little bit more understeer on power. Because this car is a little bit nervous with the turbo lag and the immense amount of power that just shoots to the rear wheels, this can be a really good way of controlling the car a little bit on corner exit, and it's something that we commonly do in our factor as well. Beyond this, you can make some brake bias adjustments based on your personal driving style. It may be an idea to drop the brake pressure down by one or two points, depending on how your brake is feeling. The brake still feels quite iffy in AMS2 as a whole, they still need to dial in its behavior. I'm not sure whether it's the curve or how it responds to the cars, but it does need some more dialing in. And in terms of the brake bias, 5644 is actually a good starting point for this car. Try and balance the car using other means first, and we'll get into that now. So this is the big one for this car, the suspension adjustment. Suspension, for me personally, has always been the hardest thing to tweak. Dampers in particular, it's such a non-specific science. It almost feels more like it's art than science. So we'll delve into that and hopefully give you guys an insight as to how spring rates, how dampers function uh, in relation to this car and track. And maybe you can extrapolate it to other areas where you guys may be having some trouble. So the first thing we look at is the caster angle. The caster angle is the angular displacement of the steering axis from the vertical axis of one of the wheels in the car. So if you can imagine yourself looking at one of the driven wheels from the side, that essentially dictates what angle the suspension is coming at it from, whether it's directly vertical or it's slightly on an angle facing the driver. Basically, the higher the caster angle, the harder it is to turn the wheel in, but the more directness that you get from the steering. So the car strangle in this car starts all the way down and I'm not too big a fan of that so I tend to go to 6. That'll make the steering a little bit more direct, you won't need as much input to spur a turn, it'll feel more direct, a little bit more heavy, I tend to prefer it that way. So moving down from there, the stock camber seems decent for this track, you might be able to experiment going half down but I would keep it at three for the time being. Now the ride height is the big one, Kailami is a fairly flat circuit, you can actually go about four points down. So 36 and four points down on the rear as well. You might even be able to go further down. You can probably do a, a 35, 50 if you so wish. Uh, the next big one is the spring rate. The car is just too loose on the surface. So we go up two points and we go up two points on the rear as well to maintain that same aero uh, suspension balance. The reason we have a spring rate that's heavier at the front than the rear is because we want the car to basically be pushed into the ground more with the aero at high speeds, which will give us a little bit more it gives the car more stability, having the front uh, be be stiffer, it makes the car understeer a bit more, but it also makes it a little bit more responsive. So it's generally a good idea to have the front spring rate a little bit higher than the rear on most cars. This isn't the case for all cars, but certainly most cars. Now, the next thing that we do is to make the car a little bit more, I guess, uh, purposeful yet nervous is the the slow bumps. So we'll jack these up by one across the board. Now, as well as this, we're going to bump up the slow rebound at the front by one. What that essentially does is it fights the, 
extension of the suspension when you're under power. So if you can imagine when you get on the power, it'll make the transition a little bit smoother and makes the car less nervous when transitioning between states because that's what the slow rebound does. It fights the suspension extension process. Um, to go with that, we're going to make the slow bump on the rear a bit heavier. Once again, it's gonna, that's going to fight the suspension uh, allowing the car to basically squat down into the rear wheels. So it's going to kind of create a situation where the car balances itself out a little bit between states. Uh, again, rear camber angle. If you're going to adjust the front, maybe adjust the rear, the balance on this car is pretty decent. So if you go half a degree down, make sure to do it across both. For the time being, we'll just keep it right here. Now, I don't know why you only get a fast rebound adjustment on this car and not anything else. I'm assuming that the rest is all tied into the slow damper settings on this car. So for now, we'll just leave it. Now, we have an extreme amount of toe out on the front wheels. Toe out is basically how far outwards they look. Helps the car turn in a lot more, bite into the corners. But the further you go with this, the more nervous the car becomes and the more likely it is you can lose the rear end. So we balance that out with some toe in on the rears. Just one point should do in this car will just make the rear a little bit more steady under those mid-speed corners and those hairpin pivots. So that is the majority of our suspension adjustment. You can of course tweak it more to your heart's content. I'm not saying this is a min-max setup for this track, but I'm saying that this will get you better results than the stock setup. So moving to the drivetrain, Obviously, we want to set the boost pressure all the way to 100. We're just being robbed of performance otherwise. The radiator opening under... So if you're doing an endurance race, you obviously need a radiator opening that's not going to result in your engine blowing over a long stint. But if you're just doing hot lapping and engine, you know, engine damage isn't being modeled as well as it should be, you can probably drop this down to about 10% or 0% because the more you open it, uh, the more aerodynamic drag you create on the car and the slower you go essentially. These two should not matter at all because the cysts are off for this car. And the big one for this is the rear differential, right? So the way the two that we're looking at are the coast ramp and the preload, and I'll explain why. What the coast ramp controls is the amount of uh, rotational lock between the two tires on the rear axle when you're off power. So the reason this applies to us is that this car's a little bit understeery when you're off power. What increasing the ramp angle will do, let's say up to 60, is allow the car to rotate into the corner more freely because both of the wheels are allowed to spin at different speeds to a point to allow the car to do what it needs to do. Now, what the preload does is it alters the rate at which you switch between the power ramp and the coast ramp settings respectively. So the lower you go, the more nervous and twitchy the car becomes, but the more responsive it becomes. The higher you go, the easier it is to drive, but the less overall responsive it is to driver inputs. So in this case, we can go down by about two points here, going up by about 10 on the coast ramp, and all in all, that will constitute the setting uh, with the amount of difference that you saw. So between the ride height, the stiffening of the suspension, the increased caster angle, and the rear differential, so we haven't even touched the camber, we haven't really messed with the tire pressures other than dropping the rears for some extra stability. Just between these things, you're looking at about two seconds gained per lap. Something that's worth bearing in mind is that just because the setup is quicker around a racetrack doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be easier to drive. In some cases, it makes the car way more nervous, it takes a lot more driver input, it becomes a lot more exhilarating, but it certainly takes a lot more effort. If you look at onboard footage of some of the very best racing drivers in the world, Ayrton Senna, Michael Schumacher, the racing legends, you can see an immense amount of micro-corrections happening because these guys were absolute masters of knowing when a car was at its limit. They would have the car set up to a point where they could essentially quasi-semi-slide it through every corner to make sure they extracted every single little bit of the lap time. So I hope that's insightful for you guys. If you're interested in the full series on car setups, do let me know down below. And in the meantime, make sure to smash that subscribe, stay up to date with all future sim racing news, reviews, and guides. Until next time, we'll see you guys later.